so uh, just to go through the foundational science areas, then the management focus project, capacity building, which is our round robin that we're trying to do more operationally. Let's dig into that. Uh, listed on the agenda was adaptation. Uh, if, uh, any, we'll just ask if there's any updates. Um, and I think the, uh, the short turnaround time or the near-term action was to have the revised. Uh, each of the foundational science areas submitted proposals. They were peer-reviewed with comments. We were looking to get co uh, modifications to those proposals based on those reviewer comments and have those posted, uh, have those back from the PIs by December 1st so that we could post them on the revamp website uh, kind of December 2nd or 3rd. So uh, uh, going through the list here, ask uh, Dennis or Shannon if they have any up updates from that at patient team. So this is Dennis. Um, just, you know, just a reminder that we get our first new newsletter out that focused on adaptation. Um, Tyler Beaton, Shannon McNeely was really uh, helped uh, pull that together. We'll look at um, the other foundational areas and um, capacity building over the next uh, um, coming quarters. Um, we've got our revisions in on the proposal, um, working on um, trying to re-engaging uh, with the broader working group um, within the uh, adaptation um, sort of working group within the, the region. The national adaptation meeting um, is coming up um, in um, May. No. Yes. And so, you know, for those of you who are attending, please let us know. Um, we'll try to coordinate something that week um, prior to our Open Science Conference. Um, Shannon, do you have anything to add? Uh, sure. I, I'll just say, you know, basically the the main things that I've been working on for the adaptation science area are. Um, one is helping the Intertribal Buffalo Council implement their USDA drought, in, drought Adaptation Grant, um, working with the National Drought Mitigation Center and NIDIS and the USDA Climate Hub. Um, Jeff Morissette's been involved in that with me as well. The other is continuing to develop the Wind River Reservation um, Drought Preparedness Project. So we've been working closely with them, had the workshop last week at the reservation. Um, and then um, still working with Tyler on doing the analysis of the dry interviews that I've conducted um, in South Dakota and the Northwest Colorado and now the Wind River Reservation. I started doing interviews there, so I'm beginning the coding of that. Um, and specifically, we're looking at doing sort of um, focus on management decisions and trying to geocode that, looking at um, related climate drivers and ecosystem impact. And then lastly, the new development that we're working on, that the center is working on, that I'm co-leading, is working with the um, Colorado State BLM office. They are in the process of developing their state climate adaptation strategy, and um, I am helping to co-lead the um, integration of social science and, and human dimensions, human systems into that. Um, strategy. So that's it for now. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Shannon. I think that Joe Barsubli is not here or is not on the call. He had previously uh, scheduled. He wasn't sure. He didn't have these on the calendar. He moved them up a week. Uh, I think we're still waiting to hear, and I'm not sure if he's got the postdoc hired. I don't know if Andrea Ray, who I think was on the phone, if you knew of any update on where he was with that hire? Okay, uh, I guess maybe, I thought Andrew was on, but maybe not. Um, uh, maybe she's so, muted. Okay. Not hearing you, Andrew, if you're on. Okay, I could be wrong. I don't see you on the participant list. Um, so, uh, in fact, we've had our June, uh, the postdoc work with Andy visiting in the last few days. Appreciate him making the trip. Uh, kind of indoctrinating him to the bureaucratic and scientific uh, opportunities at the center. <laughs> uh, so that's been great. And I don't know, I'll let Andy, you can give any updates you, you'd like. Yeah, good. Arjun, would you want to say hello and just briefly yeah. mention where you're from and all? Okay, uh, hello. <laughs> uh, Arjun, uh, just, I came from a Baylor University recently, uh, defended my dissertation. Uh, 
No, I was uh, while I I was in Baylor, I was working at uh, uh, to analyze the climate change effects on uh, scrub land ecosystems, species uh, scrub species response to climate change or elevated drought and uh, uh, some computer modeling to um, predict uh, the scrub. Predict the carbon dynamic uh, in the scrub land uh, in the future. Okay, good, thanks. Um, let's see, this month, um, Arjun and, and I have been working on, he basically got started about, what, three weeks ago, and we've been developing a refined work plan uh, from our proposal, starting with. Uh, basically analysis of change in land cover and land use and its impact on fragmenting natural cover types across the domain. Um, we expect to this week complete our revisions on the, uh, the proposal as Jeff asked us to do by December 1st. We, uh, we had, a, we had uh, accepted for funding a proposal to the NASA Land Cover Land Use Change Program that I think will be quite relevant. Um, it deals with the Rockies to the Cascades, so just a portion of the CSC domain, but it will allow careful analysis of change in land cover and land use over the past 30 years or so and um, be testing hypotheses on potential climate drivers of land use and using that as a basis for projecting uh, into the future under different scenarios. Uh, we also had a paper accepted uh, really that stems from the, um, the work that um, was done under our, our 2012 foundational funding and that involved basically an assessment of tree species uh, uh, response to climate change across the northern Rockies in the context of a vulnerability assessment. And then one other thing of note, there's, I guess I've been involved with a, a NASA decadal survey project that's basically asking what, what missions NASA ought to do for the next 10 years with regard to, to Earth sciences. Um, and that that discussion, I think, is highly relevant to the CSC in terms of um, indicators of change that are highly relevant to stakeholders. And then, additionally, Kathy Whitlock here has has organized a visit by Tom Armstrong from um, the U.S. Uh, global Change Research Program, and, and similarly there, there are discussions going on how um, assessment at the state level would be done as part of that program with the focus on Montana. And the discussions there again deal with really nicely with all the, the core issues of the CSC, and that is basically how, how do we, how do we um, make climate science related information relevant to management decision making. So those things are pretty exciting. Um, so that's the foundational work, uh, Jeff, thanks. Good, that does, and I'll uh, like to hear more about the land cover land use change uh, proposal. We can take it offline and see where it can integrate, and I agree 100% of the survey is an opportunity for us to uh, maybe think about some things uh, that uh, we're in way in. I appreciate that wedge and impact in, in, in that plan. Uh, so let's move now, and I think we kind of break up this agenda into kind of 10 minute blocks and move into the management focus projects. Uh, the, uh, maybe, and we'll get, go right back to you, Andy. I don't see anybody from Susan or Barry or Nina on the call. No, there's Susan just joined, okay. So yeah, uh, Andy, do you want to summarize anything? work uh, this week or this, uh, this uh, month on the management focus projects and just to, in general for all the management focus projects they were all funded sort of in the October time frame. The NICWIS does have an annual reporting requirement 
Uh, Stacy will be in touch with folks as far as that, that outline, what the template has to be for that annual report. Because of the way the budgets worked out, the socioeconomic uh, project in Southwest Colorado already did their annual report because we wanted, we needed it. They added funds to them in February time frame. But uh, just a heads up to, to the white bark pine and the surrogate species is we'll be looking for an annual report uh, uh, sort of uh, before the uh, end of the calendar year. But let me hand it over to Andy if you have any updates, then we'll go to Susan. Yeah, a uh, couple things. So the Yellowstone Biennial Science Conference was uh, three, four weeks ago, and uh, there was just a wealth of white bark pine oriented research there and offline discussions um, with many of the uh, GYCC white bark pine subcommittee folks being present at the meeting. So that was that led to really good discussions. Um, that subcommittee organized a follow a, a workshop actually now two weeks ago here in Bozeman where they they invited five or six different um, researchers who were looking at climate change related impacts on white bark, um, they invited them to summarize their findings and it all led to a discussion of how could those findings be used to help uh, frame the, um, the white bark pine management strategy that uh, is currently being developed. And uh, there's going to be some follow up work to that. So that fits directly in with one of the objectives of our project of trying to come up with um, white bark pine management strategies that take into account climate science. Yeah. Good, and I think that uh, that question came uh, following on the Yellowstone was the greater uh, was the. Uh, 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 Northern Rockies Adaptation Partnership, and I was there and met some folks. Uh, that we're doing white bark pine stuff and asking, okay, so how is the stuff that the Northwest Climate Science Center is funding, uh, combining with the stuff that the Great Northern LCC is funding, combining with what the North Central is funding, as well as other funding sources, and uh, kind of the subcommittee meeting that uh, Andy mentioned was the first step in kind of at least putting cards on the table, and Tom Olaf is organizing a call to say, okay, what do we do next? Hopefully Goose Bisball, my counterpart in Northwest, and uh, Tom and others from the Great Northern, We'll kind of see. Okay, these are these have all been really strong and useful two to three year projects. But what, what are we going to do with this and go from there? So uh, it's good that North Central has a stake in the game through Andy's project, and we'll, we'll sort of try to figure out collectively what, what goes on, uh, kind of in the next step. Sense. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. And and if I could just also mention the the social survey component of our project is. Um, coming along quite nicely. Uh, Liz Shanahan and Helen Naughton have basically now have a quite a refined set of methods and they ran the questions and the methods by that White Bark Pine subcommittee at that meeting and got a lot of good input. Um, and basically the plan now is to actually begin to execute um, the survey across a three state region here in the, in the coming couple of months. So we're happy to be making progress on that. Cool. Andy, this is Shannon. Is that still focused on ecosystem services, or what's the? How does the focus shape up with the survey? Yeah, it's uh, it, it does. Um, it it really deals with with people's uh, valuation of white bark in terms of ecosystem services and in terms of of aesthetics. Basically, and both um, market approaches and um, market approaches are being taken. And then, additionally, we're, we're trying to address tolerance of different management activities in different federal land jurisdictions. Uh, generally, aimed at that question of people's attitudes about active management in in wilderness and national parks. I think those are the two main thrusts. And is Liz Shanahan on as kind of part of the adaptation uh, team? Are you talking to me? Uh, either you or Andy, or anybody who would know. 
I mean, what do you mean by team? She's on the she's on the sort of list for our working group or network or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, so uh, yeah, that's what I meant. Just sort of the email list and in communication with the group because it'd be good to make sure yeah. that we have cross fertilization there with those. So good. Yeah, she is on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Uh, thanks, Andy. And uh, moving along, Susan, do you want to give a monthly update on the surrogate feces work? Sure. Um, hello, all. Um, yeah, I can talk about our recent progress and sort of four components of the work we're doing. Um, ben Rashford at University of Wyoming is doing an economics component, and he is working to update and improve um, the existing empirical land use models, developing new ones that will then be integrated into the new refinements of our species distribution models. Um, and he, he and Gordon Reese have been working on this, have spent quite a bit of time um, in this, in this way, it's kind of responding to something that happened, but they're trying to reduce the problems caused by misclassification error in the cropland data layer, which is a, a layer that they're using in here, and they've made great progress on that. They've also you know, gotten all the layers to run the land use model, measures of economic returns, uh, quantity prices, crop yields, such things measures of soil quality, measures of government paper, and the historic climate data. So I think Ben is probably finishing up that modeling. Um, he mentioned it would be ready for Valerie to use uh, by the end of this month. And then Helen has um, got a couple different um, pieces of the work going together. One is has uh, taken quite a while to get the appropriate evapotranspiration data that she wants to use for both historic and future, and she's finally put that piece together, and so she's able to really proceed on some models that she's doing to predict wetland condition in the Great Plains relative, or in the um, prairie potholes relative to climate. And her second component is dealing with the surrogate species aspect of the work. And there's several different frameworks that are out in the literature on how to quantify these surrogate relationships. And they're implementing some of these frameworks to test them and using the uh, prey pothole birds as a case study. And one of the recent ones that's really emerged in the literature they um, are especially interested in, it's called the species archetype model. And she's currently running that. She ran some preliminary um, uh, runs of that, and Barry Noon actually um, presented some of those findings. He was invited to uh, give a talk in a symposium at the uh, Wildlife Society meetings. On the symposium was entitled "Real World Applications of Surrogate Species: Colon Insights and Lessons Learned," and his talk was on algorithms to identify candidate surrogate species. So he kind of marched through a bit of the history of work on surrogate species and then coming up to some of these new algorithms that are now available. And he got really good feedback on it. So they're proceeding, and or we are all proceeding on fleshing kind of out some of these algorithms to, to really uh, push the surrogate species uh, um, approach a bit um, forward so that it's, you know, work that is representative. Um, and justifiable. And then finally, the, the last component, um, Valerie Steen is working on um, refining the species distribution models, and she's awaiting to do her final runs um, when we receive the uh, economics layer from Ben. And in the meantime, she's working on doing very similar modeling with the migrant birds, so the en route birds that we have quite a bit of data for, both from our own surveys, but also from eBirds. So I think that there's been a lot of activity on all of these fronts. Good to hear. Uh, that'll be, uh, especially the surrogate species research, I'm glad that you're tying into that. Uh, I think that we got... Uh, Jeff, excuse yeah. me. I just I just had a quick question for Susan. This is Shannon. Have you been interacting at all or communicating with um, Heather Yoakum in terms of the ethnographic 
work she's doing interviewing managers up there, Susan? Uh, no, I, I don't think I've heard of her work. Okay. What's her name? Heather Yoakum. She's the one working for Andrea Ray. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think when she first came on, that was just a, a, a little bit ago, I did hear her name then. No, we haven't um, communicated yet. And so tell me what her, her project is again. Can we can we take that offline because we're gonna have to move to uh, the sure uh, no the, problem right, yeah we we'll, we point. can talk about it later okay so I think we have uh, Rudy and uh, Renee on the call and maybe I'll just ask Renee if you want to give an update of the Southwest Colorado project sure yes <clears throat> sorry if my voice is a little uh, scraggly here I have a bit of a cold but um yeah um I know that. Uh, when Nina presented earlier, she uh, presented some of the information on the social aspect where we're at with our um, the social science part of the project, um, in addition to uh, some of the climate information. Upcoming, um, the new version of all of this is that this week, uh, Thursday, we are having a workshop in Gunnison Basin um, to develop what we call the ecological response models to the three climate scenarios that MTAS Rangwala has provided to us. So um, MTAS has, has provided us a, what we call a hot and dry scenario, a moderately hot and no change of precipitation scenario, and a warm and wet scenario. And the question is, is what are the ecological impacts associated with each one of those scenarios to um, our targets that we're paying attention to. In this case, it's the sagebrush system, both the Wyoming sagebrush and the Montane sagebrush, as well as the spruce fir subalpine zone in Gunnison Basin. So this Thursday, um, we'll spend all day with the ecologists um, and users, mostly ecologists in the Gunnison Basin, uh, BLM, Forest Service, National Park Service, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and NRCS and um, Western State University. Um, and our goal will be to, in the end of the day, have a pretty good ecological response model associated with each one of these scenarios. So let me just give you an example. Um, for Wyoming sagebrush, we, um, we know that the general um, pattern for Wyoming sagebrush distribution-wise is that the precipitation annual precipitation is between seven and sixteen inches of annual rainfall or about average of nine point five inches with with our hot and dry scenario um we see a ten percent decrease in annual precipitation mostly um generated by the large decrease in the summertime there's a twenty percent decrease in summer precip. And coupled with that is a six degree Fahrenheit increase in summer temperature. Um, so um, when you couple those precip and, and temperatures together, um, all of a sudden you go from an average temperature at Blue Mesa Dam, summer temperature of 64 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And you basically effectively have a seven inches of rainfall a year. And if you were to put that into the whole distribution it's uh, of, of sagebrush, Wyoming sagebrush, it's outside of the range, um, the current range of Wyoming sagebrush. So it's, it's basically starting to develop a new novel system in the Gunnison Basin by the year 2035. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed this Thursday is to take this information that we've been gathering, share it with the uh, um, ecologists and the managers and develop a simple diagram that um, uh, delineates or desc describes the ecological impact and from that um, in subsequent workshops um, in the spring coming up this spring will be to develop adaptation strategies um, from a social and ecological perspective um, for the sagebrush and spruce fir systems in the Gunnison Basin and the Pinion Juniper and Seeps and Springs in the San Juan Basin. So that's that's a pretty rapid um, summary. 
So just a question, are they are they mainly conceptual models with that ecological response or are you actually getting into some data observations and, and more of the mechanistic or correlative models? There, it's mostly a conceptual model. So it'll be a box and arrow diagram <laughs> um, that sort of picks up on the subtle differences between these different scenarios and that describes that, hey, um, this uh, we expect so box and arrow diagram. This is Wyoming sagebrush with a hot and dry scenario um, has a, a high likelihood of changing to a whole new normal grassland system that's hardly even known uh, in the Gunnison Basin at this point. So it's really it's a, a conceptual model rather than um, any other kind of model. Like that, I think that makes sense. To move to a uh, data-driven model, possibly after if there's need or interest, and in the, the NCCSC could support that activity. And the, I know the Colorado Natural Heritage Program is really pretty savvy at using those models as well. So just something. Yep. That keep in mind, I guess. Yep. That would be great. Thanks. I will pass that along because I think I think they're they're eventually when we start getting at adaptation strategies, um, it would be nice to have some. Um, Models driven, you know, with data, data-driven models that start to depict sites uh, within the Gunnison Basin. Um, so let's stay. And here. Renee, Renee, this is Shannon. Just a quick comment. I don't think you were on in the beginning of the call when I mentioned that I'm working with um, Bruce Rittenhouse on their state-level Colorado um, BLM climate mm -hmm. adaptation mm -hmm. strategy and integrating yeah. the social and management decision stuff into that. And I think you and others from um, CNHP have been working with them on the ecosystem yep. part of it, and so we've we've had different um, we've had a couple discussions about sites to focus on for case case studies for mm -hmm. this um, mm -hmm. social component, and so we should stay in touch because you know we've discussed obviously that the Southwest Colorado project might have some good um, things to include for that. So I just want to mention that real quickly because I don't know if you knew that that was. That that was happening. Yes, thank end. you. Oh. I meant to be on the call on Monday, and I totally uh, got sidetracked. So okay, um, but thank you very much for mentioning that. I'll, I'm I'm going to give Bruce a call as well. So yes, we'll stay okay. in touch. Sounds good. I think it's a yeah, great we'll synergy. Okay. okay, great, great, thanks. Okay, I think we have Kevin on the call, and so it will since it's uh, the America View Phenocams is part of uh, you know kind of following in the agenda. And that's specifically what Kevin is going to talk about. Maybe I'll hand over to him, uh, and then if, if time allows, we can give an update on the uh, indigenous geography and the training. Um, but for the uh, for the sake of uh, handing it over to Kevin, and Kevin, can you just confirm that you can hear us and that you're? Yep. Online? Excellent. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, uh huh. I'm here. And I will pass the ball over to you to present your uh, or your desktop. Will be shared with the group. Appreciate you joining. I was saying Kevin is uh, kind of uh, uh, took over from I think Rick Landimer, who was the American View contact when we initiated this, and then trying to uh, put phenocams uh, in the. Uh, these are. This is a national network. It's kind of started at University of New Hampshire and uh, Harvard University to associate phenocam imagery with uh, mainly CO2 flux towers, but serving as a key validation component for uh, remote sensing phenology, as well as kind of giving a visual uh, interpretation of some of the stuff that might be collected at a MET tower or uh, other instrument tower. Uh, it's. Uh, since we initiated this program, NEON, uh, the National Ecological Observation Network, has decided to put phenocams on their towers, so that should complement what we're doing fairly well. Uh, the uh, deployment uh, has been through the America View program, which is another USGS program that is within the Climate and Land Use program, and so there's uh, USGS interest in making sure that the various programs that fall within climate and land use uh, are talking to each other, uh, are uh, are, are um, kind of uh, complementing each other in their analysis and research, and that's sort of the the background with this. And I guess I'll hand it over to Kevin. I'm not sure if you are able to share your desktop, but I'm not seeing it. Um, there should be an icon that to I share your desktop, and you can even pick an application if you just want to share PowerPoint or. Oh, okay. How do do I need to do that? Yeah, it should be on the the WebEx window. Should have an icon that says to share your desktop. 
Um, or accept accept it. Where I'm just looking where that lives. Is it? Um, I see. Well, can you email it? To your talk, your talk to us, and we can run it from here. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I. I mean, is there a, a place within the window that I should be looking for the icon? It could be behind if you have other things open. Oh, okay. Like one of the little. It could be. It could be a little box that says accept. I'm sorry, I'm just not or along the top under the share button, it may say my desktop. Yeah, if you've got the meeting center as the active application, yeah. there could be a menu item for share. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm running the, not the installed version, but, okay, um, share my desktop monitor too. Okay. Good. Yep, we're getting it. So, got it. All right. So, let me see. We'll let you uh, take it away. F okay, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm going to, um, uh, apologize and acknowledge uh, to start off with um, uh, we uh, have not had network connectivity here at the State Department where I'm currently housed uh, for about three four days now so, so a lot of the work that I had planned to, to, to do over the weekend was, was uh, kind of crammed into smaller space than normal so I credit uh, Jeff sent me um, uh, a presentation uh, that was put together by I think the NASA develop people so I shamelessly stole a few slides from that to, to kind of uh, pad the presentation. So thank you. That's why they did it. So. Uh. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so yeah, let me um, uh, start out by explaining a little bit about uh, America View. Um, let me see. Kevin, real quick interruption. Are you running? Oh, there we go. Okay. I yeah. thought you might be running two screens. I am running two screens, but. You, okay. you see, you see the full screen version, right? We don't see the full screen vision of the America View overview okay, you slide. See the small, uh, oh, okay. The um, oh, let me let me see how to fix that. Um, I know what to do. Probably have two Good. monitors running. Yeah, right I just now. need to switch which ones. Uh, no. That's not it. Um, let me quickly change my share screen to screen one, and that should do the trick, I think. Uh, just one moment. Let me figure this out. Um, Hey Jeff, this is Joe. I managed to call in. I'm going to be listening. Hey Joe, glad you could make it. Um, Sitting in the Little Rock Airport, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to keep the noise down by being on mute. Well, Kevin is uh, playing with the screen. Did, was there any update on the postdoc hire for the Climate Foundational area? Be, um, no, not not really. We have a couple of other leads that we're trying to follow up as individuals just to see what they can convince them. Otherwise, we have some. We've been doing bureaucratic stuff about re-advertising the position because this advertisement is stale. We need to get it out there. Just say we're putting it out there. That shouldn't take long, but it turned out to be a little bit longer. We're trying to spend some of the money to get a little bit of work done. Uh, Perhaps with you know just on it, we'll see how we can spend it to get some of the work done through Mike Hobbins or through even maybe one of Justin Huntington's uh, students who might be able to work on a contract to get some of his data sets. So as we talked about when we were up there, so that the update is I, I'd like to try and spend a little money before the postdoc gets here. Um, but Ben and I have basically rewritten that position to be more definite and more attractive, I think, given what we learned on the first round. Okay. 
let's let's move on to thanks and let's move on to Kevin. It looks like you got your screen sorted out. Looks good, Kevin. So uh, I want Take to hand it back over to you. Okay, great. All right, guys. Okay, yeah. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about America View. America View um, has been around for about I don't know 12 years or so. Um, it's uh, it's uh, almost uh, entirely funded uh, at this point and in, in, in throughout our history uh, by the USGS, and um, it developed out of Ohio, what, a program called Ohio View, and it. Uh, as a program, uh, it has a, a, about, I think, 39 states in the program right now, each of which are funded through America View. Um, so uh, USGS funds America View, America View funds the state views. And uh, it's really an, a, a, an avenue to build uh, state level consortia uh, of uh, remote sensing support um, for education, um, outreach, and research. Um, and uh, a lot of the American View states, they, they work with uh, state-level actors who aren't necessarily remote sensing specialists, but can benefit from remote sensing. Uh, also, a lot is done with uh, K through 16 education, and we have some different um, um, uh, uh, research projects as well, but not, not as much research. Um, so, uh, so phonology, uh, as I assume a, a lot of you know, um, refers to the kind of the seasonal cycle of the uh, growth and, and senescence of of plants. Well, uh, from a remote sensing perspective, um, that's observable, and uh, um, depending on the um, the frequency with which you have observations, particularly with instruments like MODIS, uh, you can develop a really a detailed uh, temporal resolution of your phonology um, uh, for the, the growth and, and senescence of different plants and determine um, uh, what the, uh, the, you can link that to a lot of different things, uh, net primary producti productivity, uh, you can look at over time seasonal shifts depending on, on um, uh, things like if there's some climate influence that's changing over time, if you look between years, um, you can observe a shift in the, the green update or the peak uh, green estate or, or other things like that. So hold on a second, I'm trying to, okay. So um, yeah, I mean, there, there are um, a lot of concerns, particularly with climate and, um, and, and changes in climate, that if you look at a broad scale, over a long period of time, you can uh, map how changes are occurring, and uh, you do it for basically everywhere. So that's kind of the the, the uh, interest in, in taking this approach. Um, as far as the America View specific network within the PhenoCam network, um, we've got um, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana. Uh, and uh, Wyoming and Colorado. Each one of those um, has uh, a phenocam that's associated with, uh, the, that's actually funded by the North Central Climate Science Center. Actually, Kansas has a couple on there because um, we're kind of counting one of the neon stations uh, that we have that's local to uh, the University of Kansas where I'm usually housed. And there's, there's a much broader network over the United States as well that isn't represented here. So what's, what's the PhenoCam look like? It's uh, essentially a, just a, a webcam, uh, a nice webcam, but that has um, um, usually um, at least our red, green, and blue uh, bands, but the ones that we're using also have uh, an infrared band, which allows us to derive uh, NDVI, the natural, uh, the normalized vegetation difference index. Um, so, and the, the the camera, kind of the mechanics of how this is working, is um, uh, Colin Pinney is out of Colorado is doing all our our tech work on the setup of the cameras and uh, receiving information from each state about what their setup needs to be, and that's a really kind of a <laughs> 
more complicated process than we anticipated, I think, because uh, the sites that were selected by each different state to mount their phenocam have different needs um, in terms of power. Um, uh, if there's not network coverage um, that you can actually, you, you can plug into Wi-Fi or, or a hard line, um, you need to get a cell phone modem. So, and the cell phone modem, of course, is dependent upon um, the level of, of uh, 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 bandwidth uh, for that particular area, exactly where that that feed cam would be mounted. So we went through um, uh, several rounds of trying to figure out uh, what, uh, as far as the connectivity went, what people's needs were. In addition, um, um, power is, is, is a big issue as well. Uh, some sites are located where they have power, uh, others are not. So one of the things that we need to determine was uh, if, uh, if uh, people needed solar panels, uh, which also, if you have those, you need a battery and a lot of other things. And I'll cover that a little bit more later. Um, so basically, the way that the PhenoCam works, you mount it on some type of uh, tower. Some people uh, have it mounted on. Um, very tall, a very tall tower, like a, a water tower, it has a very large field of view. And others are like on a smaller MET tower that uh, have a, a much narrower, or uh, the field of view is the same, but uh, it, it covers less ground. And uh, typically you have a reference panel um, very close to, um, just outside uh, or in front of the camera so that you can normalize your data against uh, the local conditions. Um, so uh, that's another component as well. And uh, typically, uh, for uh, many of these um, uh, stations, like I indicated, there's a, a MET tower that they're either on or, or very near that you can associate uh, other types of data with. So yeah, I think that. So here's kind of the layout of, of where these uh, different uh, phenocams are, and this uh, graphic was provided by the, the um, uh, DEVELOP uh, project to look at, and I, I can't speak to all the analysis that, that they did, but it, um, and uh, Jeff, if you have anything to add while I'm, well, after I'm finished, uh, please chime in. Um, but they looked at a lot of different variables to look at whether these phenocams were um, indicative of the uh, the kind of uh, the different range of ecosystem types and uh, cover types and different conditions uh, across the network. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Just real quickly, yeah, the, the color coding is sort of from zero to seven, meaning that uh, seven, uh, seven different variables are sort of not represented essentially by any of the towers across some of the modus phenology and some climate predictors. I think it was kind of seasonality, summer, or heat and temperature were four, kind of in the winter and the summer. And then three modus phenology metrics, uh, length of season, maybe start and peak. And basically saying, like, if there's something that's all seven, that means, especially when you look up in North, North Dakota there, uh, you know, none of the climate or phenology metrics uh, related to that area are covered by any of the other towers. And it was sort of an analysis to say how representative are these seven locations, and then coupling to say, well, if we add some additional towers maybe, or additional phenocams, maybe this is where we might consider putting them, so like the bluer areas. Uh, and it, so it shows definitely a spatial pattern. And uh, so it's just kind of how representative the existing towers are and where we might want to put like a second round. Okay. Thank you. Is there a link online somewhere where we can see exactly where those cameras are located? I was trying to Google it. I couldn't find it. Uh, there, there is the national network. Um, the, the PhenoCam network uh, has. Uh, you can access, actually access all the cameras and all the data. We don't have a map of these specifically, um, but. Um, and that's ultimately we will we will get there um, in in terms of, of, of putting up some type of outward facing uh, interface to, to for our specific data, but we're still actually working on getting all the cameras up and in place at this point. 
But Shannon, if you just Google National Phenocam Network, you get the Phenocam site, and one of the tabs across the top is a map. I just posted on okay, the chat. Okay, thanks, Geneva. And I don't think all of ours are in there at this point because um, I don't I don't know though um, because that's really true. Only the ones that are functioning are on there. Yeah, so um, that isn't representative of our component yet. So it's the one that's hosted by University of New Hampshire, that site? Yeah. And that yeah. That, that allows you, if you sign up uh, for, um, uh, if, you, if you sign up with a login, uh, you have access to the actual data. And we'll look at what that looks like here in just a minute, a little bit, anyhow. Um, so I'll just kind of go over our different sites that we have. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about where they are and, and, and the different kinds of, of areas that they represent. Uh, this is the, the uh, at uh, Kansas, uh, the Ashland Bottoms site, which is actually um, just uh, south uh, west of Manhattan. It's along the Kansas River floodplain, and uh, the, the hope is that uh, and that. I'll, I'll kind of throw in a few things that I know about each one of the sites if I think about it uh, as we go along, because each site has its own little characteristics and challenges. Uh, this one had a pre-existing modem that we thought we were just going to be able to plug and play with, but that's not working exactly right at this point. Um, they uh, tried to do that earlier, so the folks out at K-State who manage um, the MET station that's actually right there are uh, working with Colin to try to troubleshoot that. But uh, it should, uh, in theory, um, capture, uh, as you can see along the river, a component of the riparian forest that's along there. There's agricultural land around there. And uh, so that should be within the field of view. And we'll talk about a little bit about what that means to be in this field of view and how to do extraction of data from the imagery itself. Kevin, just a time check. I know some people have to leave at the top of the hour, so about 10 yep. minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, that should be good. So um, here's the Nebraska site. Um, it is actually, I think, close to another town called Ashland, so I, uh, we'll have to pick a different name for that. Um, but again, it's uh, along the river and um, uh, should capture the riparian uh, forest vegetation there. And one thing I don't think we, I talked about initially but that was represented in that graphic was that, um, I don't know why that thing keeps popping up. Um, is that generally you want them north facing uh, because you don't want uh, direct sunlight to come through the lens. So uh, basically as you look at these, look to the north and, and that's uh, the area that will be captured. And that's a little bit closer view of that, that site. And it's not, it's really kind of a, a selection by opportunity process because you have to find somewhere where you can stick the camera. It's just, uh, not within the budget to stick up a new tower, um, so uh, we, we kind of take the opportunity to partner with somebody who will let us put a camera up. Um, here's the South Dakota site. Some of you may recognize uh, this particular place. Anybody chime in with uh, what you see? No? Okay, that's the Aeros Data Center, Sioux, or just north of Sioux Falls, which is out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, that's the um, uh, the National Data Repository for Land Remote Sensing, which downloads, that serves up, uh, receives and serves all the Landsat data, uh, the MODIS data, and lots of other kinds of data. So this is a really nice place to tie this all in uh, for America View because USGS is our funder and they, they like having the camera up there. So this is a, I, th I think the, it's actually where the, the green arrow is. So it's looking north uh, there. I'm not sure what that, they, they have a whole range of vegetation uh, along those windbreaks, I think. Uh, here is the Wyoming site, which is really out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's really inaccessible. Um, some of the challenges at that site are uh, the uh, cold and the snow. You've got no power. Um, you've got uh, no, um, you know, obviously no uh, wireless or 
or um, uh, but there's cell phone coverage, so uh, and it seems to be working okay. Uh, and that's uh, in, in some of these I, where, where where they're actually operating. I've thrown in um, some imagery. Here's the the imagery that's actually produced by the camera, and this was uh, taken today. Uh, so there's some snow on the ground, um, and you can see the kind of the sage um, uh, coverage there. When, and so and here's an infrared, the infrared imagery from uh, that same instrument. And let's see. Okay, and and so one. Uh, key point to point out is that you can actually create areas of interest within the image frame to aggregate the data that were within it uh, to and kind of summarize those into to one uh, kind of average value or look at the distribution of values, whatever you want, within uh, that particular AOI. And you can have multiple AOIs uh, if, you, if you want to. You just define a masked area and, um, and grab the data that are um, that are within that. Uh, here's kind of a snapshot of the kind of a, kind of like a, a daily um, summary of a same type of time period. It's, it's important to mention that I haven't that these are you can set the 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 rate at which the images are grabbed. You can set it like every 15 minutes that it, it grabs one. So you can look at daily cycles. You can look at cycles over time that are from the same um, the same time spot uh, every day things like that. Another thing this also shows you is that you have issues with like cloud shadow. Um, there are some days when for some reason the imagery isn't there. I don't know how to explain that, but there are all kinds of challenges with uh, the data itself. Here's a, a kind of a summary of May through August of, um, of one of the one of the data products that you can pull off the imagery as well. Some gaps in the data, a little variability. but. It's that, is, that graphic comes from the New Hampshire site? Yep, it sure does. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's automated with uh, with your area of interest defined, and so it's sort of pretty neat. Exactly. Uh-huh. Um, so here's the the Colorado site. It's at the the Pudra Learning Center, um, so uh, which is a nice place to have it. And um, it's – I think that was operational for a little while. They had a little problems with it. Now they're trying to troubleshoot it. Um, so, um, and here's an example of, of some of the imagery that was taken. Actually, that was taken today, it looks like. Um, so, but you have objects that can come into the field of view. Uh, I think I just looked at the AOI, and they actually carved out where that a backhoe is out of the AOI, so it's not represented there. So it's not influencing the data. Uh, although, if you look at the um, if you look at the um, the data, it um, uh, that thing moves around a little bit, so I'm not sure how they deal with that. So I'll, I'll talk about some of the issues, um, and um, you know, like I talked a little bit about uh, network coverage. Uh, there's the kind of the contracting. So um, you know, who owns the contract for the data to ensure its longevity, and that's an, that's uh, um, uh, done through um, uh, Jeff and the people there. I'm not sure what this what the particulars of that is, but that's the plan. You've got um, solar power, um, power of batteries. Uh, some of the batteries, um, there's concern that they'll, in the, the cold times of the year, they'll actually, um, you have to put them somewhere to kind of stay warm and so they don't die or have larger solar panels and there's snow issues and other things. So there, there are a lot of particulars to, to consider when you're know, putting out field equipment. And um, in terms of timing, we've kind of we had challenges all along the way. It hasn't gone as, as quickly as, as we would like. So sometimes we, we had planned to install at certain times of the year, and that's pushed into a different season where it's going to get cold. And so uh, some of them we're going to wait until the springtime to install. Um, so the research uh, component is still in development. Um, that's something that. Uh, uh, you know, it gets more exciting as you you, you get closer to data. Um, so uh, the research questions are in development, but we know we, we want to tie in Landsat data in particular because uh, uh, America View is, is strong with uh, Landsat and USGS. Uh, MODIS data, of course, which provides a very good temporal resolution that we can link back to the data we're getting off the Phenocams. 
We're uh, coordinating with uh, Stu Fry at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center to uh, do some kind of regular collects with the Hyperion instrument um, that will give us some hyperspectral data over the same areas. Um, we there, um, you know, you know, we're, we'll look at you know how do we link these ground-based observations with the satellite data, and what are the, what are the interesting questions that we can ask, and other ground data, like I mentioned, uh, met met data. Um, actually uh, field collections that some of these areas are near or on sites where they collect uh, really detailed vegetation information. So how do we tie that into those data as well? So um, you know, there's a whole uh, suite of, of questions we can, can ask, and uh, uh, we look forward to start working on those when we get our, our network all uh, installed. Um, so. I'll kind of I'll just j jump uh, to the end here. Jeff, if you have any concluding remarks or things to say about kind of the future growth or other ways to tie in, please feel free to talk about that if there's time. I, know, I think that was a great uh, uh, overview. And like you said, it's going to be, it'll start to get exciting now that we get data collected from some of these. Uh, one thing to maybe note is that that uh, Pooter Learning Center, uh, where we got the picture of Colin finding up on that, uh, deploying it, is that uh, Geneva is also, or we're, we're working on exploring uh, phenology trails and walks that would uh, complement the field observations of phenological, uh, you know, plant-specific phenology observations uh, with the pheno camera, and then maybe even doing a transect where we do something kind of up into Rocky Mountain National Park up to the uh, Alpine area and go from all the way down the, the, the kind of the watershed, uh, trying to look at more of a transect across those. But uh, you know, it's just a small addition, but I think that did a great job summarizing where we were with this. So appreciate Kevin. I realize you're, you're sort of doing, you got, you, you probably, you know, you got twice as much work to do with this State Department thing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, are you uh, are you being tasked to let people know what you think of the uh, Keystone Pipeline? I know that permits going through the State Department, but uh, no, no. Fortunately, I've got nothing to do with that. We're we're uh, much more concerned with Ebola and Syria, where I am right now. Okay, well, that's important for sure. So appreciate you fitting this in and doing yeah. That. Uh, just to note for people on the call, we're going to work with uh, Brian Miller to help with uh, management of this and uh, here at the center kind of having, you know, I think that the Kevin has done a great job in America view with, you know, kind of small amount of money to deploy cameras and then, uh, but not, you know, the, the bigger picture of coordinating across all of them. Kevin stepped up uh, to help with that coordination when Rick Lander mm -hmm. uh, had to leave. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll coordinate with Kevin and then ask Brian to kind of, and Brian has uh, agreed to, to kind of help out with uh, with some of these uh, coordinating things because it's starting to be different sites, not just America View. There's, uh, we've got one at the UVB site and these partner sites in NEON and so, uh, and then we have uh, a bit of capacity through uh, Brian and others' times to, to try to manage the, uh, across the different pheno cams. Uh, so, this is going to continue, and uh, we're going to kind of figure out what, how many batteries and cell phones and what we need, and hopefully in this summer of this uh, 2015, we'll start to get data from that. And I think it's interesting to note that in the foundational science area, the impacts uh, proposal that, that Andy led for the foundational area was trying to understand that phenological connection between climate, uh, uh, or the connection between climate and phenology across the domain and that, that moisture and that, uh, that, that uh, temperature precip, uh, how that's influencing that timing of the living things. And so uh, it's not just a neat project to see America View and work with USGS on that, but also maybe giving us some reference data to evaluate the remote sensing phenology and then build that connection with uh, observations that are often coincident with some good MET stations. The, uh, the phenocams are deployed, like at Eros, for example. There's a, there's a MET station there, so you can really get the detailed uh, meteorology and the phenocam as well. So uh, let me, in the interest of time, I'll just ask if anybody has any questions uh, before we wrap up. Now, this is Bob Swanson. Is there any, to, uh, didn't uh, answer about the expansion of this now? Uh, is this about the size that it's going to stay for a while, or, or is there the option of adding <coughs> along the way? 
There's, there's certainly the option to add tower, or add Fino cams, and the USGS has purchased, the, the North Central has purchased the cameras that have gone into this, and we're willing to do that probably on the order of about maybe uh, five to ten more cameras in the next two years. Uh, we're negotiating with, or kind of pinging the America View group to uh, kind of indicate what operational, what, what, what's needed to keep a camera up and running and then you know kind of how, how much funding that requires and resources and then see what that frees up in terms of budget to either do additional uh, work or uh, additional towers with the current partners. So we are looking to expand it. I'd ask uh, I guess you to, to stay in touch uh, probably through the American View program or these monthly check-ins. Well, I'd just throw out that the, that the Water Science Center has operated a number of webcams in all of the north central states and, um, and in fact we have had a not a uh, not an internet connected camera but uh, but a time lapse camera on a tower about a, a mile away from the one at Ashland in Nebraska for well, probably going on four or five years now mm -hmm. uh, and so we have people that are that are well versed in maintenance and operation of, of these types of equipment, and, uh, but the, there's also additional opportunities to site these at stream gauges and other types of installations across the country where we already have infrastructure for batteries, solar panels, and the like. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, why don't me and Brian take... Yeah, I have uh, to, just... Uh, uh, what, is, what is the format of those... Uh, Image taken by the camera cam. Let me let me just get let me close the loop with uh, with uh, uh, Bob Swanson's question. Is that Brian and I will stay in touch to see what USGS street which USGS uh, mm -hmm. opportunities. And I guess that would be through the Water Science Centers. Um, I'm not familiar, but maybe we should reach out to the Biological Research Centers as well, the NORAC and uh, Northern Prairie and Fort, but. Uh, why don't we take that offline and see what uh, what's available, uh, or what uh, what yeah, because that certainly could be plugged in uh, and should uh, if there's uh, if, uh, if there's that infrastructure. And you're also aware of Mike Forsberg's Flat River time lapse uh, project with the University of Nebraska. I am not, but just Google it and uh, you'll see he has a whole string of. 30 high resolution cameras from the headwaters of the Platte down to the mouth. What was the name what was the name on that? Platte River time lapse and uh, and Who was the it? guy that got it started was Mike Forsberg. All right, thanks. University of Nebraska and uh, Nebraska Game and Parks. By headwaters of the Platte, do you mean both the North and the South Platte? Uh, he may have uh, he may have one or two over in the in the South Platte basin, but he's uh, concentrated mostly on the North Platte coming down. But the the project is uh, is supposed to depict the all of the, the Platte River basin, so I imagine he'll be branching out there, and he's been. Uh, he's been working with uh, James Ballock of the uh, Chasing Ice Project mm -hmm. in setting this up. So he's a professional photographer. So these are all Nikon D300 uh, cameras that he's got out in the field. It's fantastic stuff. Good. We'll uh, we'll follow up on that. See where it can be integrated. And Arjun had a question on the image format. I think it's TIFF files, or maybe Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong on what the. the, the I think so, is. but uh, I haven't I haven't uh, uh, pulled the data yet to to know. Right. And I think it's up to the user to make an NDVI image. You can get the near infrared image, and then you get the three bands. And I think it's if I'm not mistaken, because uh, Gabriel had a question before he stepped out. That uh, does it create NDVI? And I think that's not operational yet with the University of New Hampshire site. 
but I, I don't I don't think so. But that's certainly something that uh, is is uh, uh, one of the key things that we want to do with these data. Yeah. Uh, another just a background is uh, Brian and I are going to be in touch with uh, the people at the Pheno Cam to see if there's if anybody's done the. Uh, Geometry, kind of like analysis of you know the height of the camera, the angle of the camera should then, and then a digital elevation model should project to you know kind of a footprint uh, of that camera onto the ground so that we have the spatial connection between that Pheno cam and then the, the imagery. It's kind of a near term analysis that we got to get done. Okay, well, we're 10 after the hour. I don't want to keep people. I do appreciate people hanging out uh, beyond, uh, especially Kevin. Thank you for uh, for the presentation. If we could get a copy of those slides, that would be great. Um, I appreciate having those. And uh, we will, uh, I think we have the foundational science team to stay on that we kind of discovered. But uh, why don't we say goodbye uh, to everyone else, and we'll, we'll check in a month from now, the, uh, the next call being, uh, what, December? Uh, December uh, 16th, which is not the 4th or the 3rd uh, for the uh, uh, Christmas holiday. Uh, and uh, we'll have another update, and we'll stay in touch with an email announcing that agenda. And I think Geneva is going to be talking about uh, the uh, phenology, uh, more on phenology, kind of the phenology of fall, we'll call it. So we'll look forward to that, and uh, we'll talk to everyone then. <coughs> Have foundational folks stay on the line. Thanks a lot. Thank you.